having tough conversations as well, really tough. If you're a manager, a part of SLT, or really run a team, you know what I'm speaking about. Being able to speak to an employee, whether it be letting them go, talking about their work performance, or really having those harder conversations in regards to anything work-related can really be annoying and also a hard skill to develop. And one of the best ways to develop any skill is, well, practice. But unless you've been a part of an SLT team or a leadership team or been in a manager role for many years, you probably don't have the cycles and this can be uncomfortable. Today, today I speak with Alleviate Labs, whose really whole goal is to solve this problem by using live actors and impromptu to really help individuals, managers, SLT to get the cycles and to be able to deliver the information in a professional manner. Many of us have faced working with a manager where the conversation was really off-putting and inappropriate. And really, this is the goal is to solve those. You as a manager being able to bring up these conversations and really feel confident you'll be able to speak and have a conversation professionally, as well as an individual who may want better public speaking skills. Alleviate Labs is really here to solve those challenges. Today's episode, we talk about how they came up with the idea, how the co-founders met, and as well, most importantly, what it really means to create a business and grow it, and why it's so important to have a product people want to pay for. Hopefully you guys enjoy this episode, learn a bit more about Alleviate Labs and how they use live actors to solve a massive problem, especially with a lot of introverts, as well as really how to create a business from the ground up while really focusing on sales and testing your hypotheses. Hopefully you guys enjoy. So Alleviate Labs essentially, what we do is uh, we train managers and high potential employees on how to effectively handle difficult conversations in the workplace. Um, and we do that not through any like any methods of let's like workshops or like instructional methods, but we're the practice piece. We're pro we're, we provide the authentic, deliberate practice, and we do this through live actor simulation. So these we hire live actors, uh, so we hire professional actors who recreate like really challenging workplace scenarios, and at the end they can they 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 practice it so many times that they're more comfortable. So when they've gone through these these mm -hmm. these simulations uh, in a safe environment, they're much more willing or much more able to do them perfectly or much better in, a, in an actual environment. And so we also can analyze the data uh, and give them the uh, give them that back in in the form of a report. Um, so yeah, that's what we do. And how did you get into that? I mean, obviously, interpersonal skills is very important, a lot of public speaking, but typically, I guess people tend to avoid confrontation, to avoid conversations. How did you find the need and kind of get that ball rolling? Did you have HR experience? Were you managing teams when you realized, hey, maybe a lot of individuals don't, aren't comfortable having these conversations or maybe don't have the practice? So how did that all start? Because I feel it's common knowledge, public speaking or speaking with individuals is hard, but they're never, I guess it's very difficult to kind of get that mission rolling or at least that idea rolling for the workplace. So how did you get into it? Well, there's, I think there's two essential reasons and I'll let Ling speak to her side because her side is mm -hmm. much more interesting than mine. Um, and and uh, so for me personally, I was, I got promoted quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and when I first started my job, I was like 25, 26, I was project engineer for this pretty, pretty large um, plant manufacturing space. And I was one of their top two, three decision makers. So it was very rapidly that I got I, I got that promotion. Um, and so I was managing people suddenly out of nowhere. A lot of these people were older than I was. Um, a lot of these people were in construction, labor workers, people that I haven't dealt with before. So a lot of times um, having difficult conversations like giving feedback or managing conflict became really, really challenging for me. Um, and no matter what I like, what kind of like books I read um, or what type of, actually let me backtrack. There was also, I had a manager who was from Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, he was from Alabama, he worked in the military um, and uh, he had like tendencies, like he wasn't, I'm, I'm gonna soft sugarcoat this and say he wasn't always the best at uh, conversing with people who weren't. Mm -hmm um of his race and so he would sometimes say things uh that were perceived by people like myself that to be uh quite hurtful um and i didn't always know how to deal with that i didn't and the other people didn't know how to deal with it either like do we go to hr do we uh, how do we talk to this person tell them this is not okay um and so dealing with that and say okay how do i i need to learn how to manage these conversations effectively um and so I started reading the books and the blog posts and all that. None of it, none of it helped. 
because I, I I got the instructional piece like even though I had a formula for how to give feedback, formula for how to manage conflict, I could never really deal with the anxiety in the moment. Um, and it's it's a common problem with a lot of the engineers that we we, we speak to and the engineers we uh, we seek to do business with is is or a lot of our learners are engineers um, is that they don't always have that practice. Sometimes um, it's for whatever reason. Um, sometimes a lot of like really deeply uh, introvert engineers are oftentimes artistic. There's, there's tons of reasons for for that. Um, but then I'm like, okay, so what can what can we do to help out with this like specific and really become better at handling these conversations? Yeah. And, and so I started doing my research. And so in the medical space, um, uh, to teach doctors bedside mannerisms, uh, what these medical schools do is like they will hire actors and they will train them and and so they would simulate like really like tough conversations like oh you have to tell this person that he's about to die um and you've got to do it in a very like um calm uh, not as a very empathetic manner yes. and so you can improve your bedside mannerisms um and they do this all throughout their degree four five six years sometimes um and they and they become better at it and and it's not even that it, it's it's and so I'm I, I at first I didn't believe that this would this could be something but then I actually hired an actor uh, as a contractor and I took my fiance through the actual simulation um, and I'm just like okay you know you tell me if this felt real because I'm just, I didn't believe that it was going to be that real yeah. I'm, just, I'm I'm going no this is an actor I it's, it's going to be in the back of my head it's not going to be believable uh, but I was lucky um, and she's she's still on uh, she's still an actor with Alleviate now after like a year and a half. Um, and I remember this, like my fiance coming out of that conversation with palms sweating. Like she was just like all shaken, like it, just giving this actor feedback in like a similar way. It's it just, she she was really thrown off by it. So I'm like, okay, I know that there's something here. Like you actually like, simulate it and then give feedback around it. Um, and so I found that to be a really powerful tool. And 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 yeah, I, I think that's kind of where the, the, the roots of uh, the, the idea started. And I'll pass it off to Link because he has a cool story. Um, yeah, so I first, when Noam Fatter first told me about this business, about um, simulation, I was like, it sound, I was really skeptical. Mm -hmm. And until he put me through the simulations to try the product, um, it completely changed my perception around. Um, so I went through four simulations, which is the complete module of one of our services. As I did more um, simulations, the more realistic, the more difficult, more complicated got. So that really made me see the value because when I was the middle manager before coming to um, Sauter and do my MBA, I always wonder how my um, team perceived me when I gave feedback. But of course, when I asked them for feedback, they'll be like, oh, no, it was all good. Like I, did, I couldn't tell whether they're just being nice or they're scared of providing actual mm -hmm. feedback to me um so getting the actual genuine feedback from the actors really show me how i was being perceived and i think that's what a lot of managers need in order to perfect their communication skills um and then the other thing is because i was working at a technology startup for a consumer product i was working uh with mostly engineers so again, as Wolf Hatter said, very highly intelligent, um, emotional intelligence may need some work or may need some help. Um, and they provide a lot of feedback. Um, and I was actually caught into human rights tribunal last year or two years ago because one of the conversation went sideways and it actually brought a very severe damage to a company because the feedback was not perceived correctly or it was not mm -hmm. it didn't go the way as planned um so that showed me how things can really bring in unexpected impact to the business or to the person when the person don't deliver it correctly yeah i i think what you touched on is very interesting because obviously um even throughout my career and through the MBA as well, a lot of times actors are brought up, right? I've done sales in the past. So it was always like sales training and the live simulation. And I mean, you can both attest to this, that every time you go into a group, people are like, hey, we're going to do some live practice, get up in front of the stage and talk. Everyone always says, this is not real. Why am I practicing this on game? Or when I'm on the call, I will never do this. I will never do this. 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm too good, but I know this is fake. But every single person you ever talk to who goes through it says, yeah, realistically, what I said there or did there is how it act in the real situation. I think humans, we always overestimate how good we are at communicating. But I'll, I'll, I think we also overestimate how we think we will change in the spur of the moment. Like, oh, no, no. If it's a real situation, I'll act different. I'll be more professional. I'll know I can read the situation more. And I mean, there's always those famous sports quotes where it's like, you know, Everyone has a plan to get punched in the face. I think Mike Tyson said that, but it's very true. And I even, even in interviews, even though I think everyone can come go back to an interview where you practice all the time, but just talking to yourself and you get to the interview and they ask a question. You're like, Oh, my heart's racing. I'm nervous. Uh, and you, and you leave the interview and you're like, that was such a bad interview. And you learn that to practice interview skills, for example, you need a real person. And I think it's really smart how you, incorporated actors and i think a lot of people had a very similar view when you look at it you're like uh, uh this is just an actor i know it's fake i won't be my best self but it is by far the best practice you can do and it's also i think one thing you spoke about especially with managers i find that a lot of managers i worked with previously in my career who may be higher up or were the founder of a company they may not get feedback because an employee saying hey i don't like the way you talk to me um never really works out, especially if you're scared for your job. So I really think that using a kind of a third party who can give it to you straight is very important. So when the, so you have this idea, you realize this is a problem. How does it start? Do you start consulting for other businesses? Do you start bringing in actors? Like how does this come from an idea that you did for yourself and start kind of rolling into a more of a corporate business or at least getting some customer in mind or making at least a revenue focus in mind not to just do something for yourself but to share it with other people i think the first thing the first thing uh when i first started was i had to do was i had to wait i had to find a way to test the hypothesis mm -hmm. um and i like there's a tons of ways to test hypothesis mm -hmm. like you do customer discovery interviews you do um all sorts of things right like there's there's surveys you can run like you can read research reports so validation is is a, but by far the the greatest validation is if somebody can give you money for it uh, or is willing to give you money for it um so i i think the first first within the first few hours of starting the company i came up with or having the idea i just came up mm -hmm. with a, a minimum viable pitch um mm -hmm. and with that pitch i just started like started cold calling um, I think I was on day number five of cold calling. Um, and this is my first time cold calling. I've never done mm -hmm. like true sales in the past. This is my yeah. first time. I'm just nervous throughout the whole thing. Um, and, and, and I think the one person on the Friday, on Friday, like evening at like five is my like last rock for the weekend. Mm -hmm. I say, like, okay, this is maybe I'll, I'll try again next week and see what happens. Um, but the guy who picked up the call and I said, he's just like, I'm just like, oh, hey, do you want to do a customer discovery call? And, all this stuff. And he said, he's just like, I don't have time for this. What's your value proposition? And I told him, so this is what we do. This is how we do it. Um, and he's just like, oh, that sounds really cool. Um, come give me a demo next week. Um, so a week later, I gave him the demo. Um, I said, I'm, I'm going to do it for a cheap price. Um, he loved it. And, and we closed the deal on the spot. Um, oh, wow. And so, so within the first two weeks of me starting the company, I had a sale, so I knew it was going to be something that I was going to do. It, yeah. it was going to be something. Yeah. That's, that is like the ideal. I feel like every incubator or like university run a startup program, they're like, you're the example. I, you know, get a talking customer and actually get them to pay a dollar. I think that's actually the hardest step for almost every startup I've ever like really speak to. They're like, my idea is great. I have a thousand customers who say they're going to pay. I'm like, oh, like, do you have any money yet? No, but like when I do, they're going to pay me. And everyone knows that no one wants to be nice in person but until you get a paying customer. And then the real feedback comes out. And I think that is great. How in two weeks, you're like, you know what? Let me test it out. Let me try to make a sound. I think that's a really good step for most people. And I, I bet you're probably in a situation where there was like no real developed product yet. There's still a lot of work to do, but saying, Hey, if I can get someone to pay for it, at least there is something here. People find value in and I keep, and keep running with it. So two great turnaround time in two weeks you you know cold call you start this journey you get a paying customer 
Then what? So you realize, hey, you know, this is there's a cha- there's something here. Not really, sure, you're probably not still really sure where your you know folks are going to be. But then what's what's step two now? Do you start looking at developing a product? Do you start outsourcing? Like, how do you get the ball rolling? Because I feel like now you have the hunger, you have the drive. There's some some glimmer of hope here. There's some diamond in the rough. But the next step is now: how do I make this a business? I feel so. How did that transition work? Yeah, it was it was really interesting. I just I knew from a previous status experience that I I needed help. And so after I I I, I immediately I went in and I joined. Um so I wasn't in the MBA program yet, but you know Fraser. Um I I asked him if I could join the 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 incubator. Um and he was very nice. He said, Yeah, come join and we'll see um like how you do, right? And and so if you know anything about EAGBC, they kick you out after like every month you say start like they like 47 companies apply 35 get in um and then a month later you've got uh 15 left and then the month later you've got like seven left so like they aggressively filter mm-hmm. for like people or companies who who don't aren't, aren't serious about it so i joined i joined that the NQ. that was my that was my next step mm-hmm. because i knew i just needed help um i am like I, I came to Canada when I was 19. I don't have all the business contacts in the world. Mm-hmm. I don't even necessarily have a huge community um, mm-hmm. apart from the the people that I've met in universities. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't necessarily don't have like people who are in the executive position. Yeah. So I knew that I need, needed a community. I knew I needed volunteers. I also knew I needed a co-founder. So I think that's kind of where like the process for me starting um, one, deciding help with sales, um, doing more customer discovery, um, seeing if there's enough, big enough. So when I validate the problem, like how big is the problem, that part was still needed to be validated. Like how many people were going to pay you for it? That part was still needed to be validated. Um, that, that, that's actually such a great answer. How many people want to pay, I think, is another step that also yeah. hurts to look at because there's a lot of like small problems that are very important to you or to your network. But taking that humble step of saying, okay, I have this problem, but well, is there enough here to have a business, to start a business, to really make it profitable, but also scalable to have employees? So I think that's a very unique step. I think you kind of, it sounds like you've done everything very, like effectively very quickly. Like you kind of knew what you wanted to do and tested it. And I think that's like a, a very good sign of success is when you're like, you know what? I think it's the same way of how you said it yourself hiring a actor is like, there's a problem here. Let's try to solve it. And let's just get to the root of the problem. Almost a little bit of engineering focus, a little bit of root cause analysis. There's some consulting terms in there to figure out what is the issues here and what can I solve? But then is that where you, like, how did you two meet then to kind of start running this business? Was it mutual connection? Like how, how did that happen? Cause I feel that's always a unique story. The uh, co-founding team connecting on the idea. I, I, I'm going to give that one to Ling, but I will start off with it. it took me a very long time to find the person who I really wanted to uh, work with. So I'd, I'd gone through several rounds of like talking to multiple people um, and it just like, I have a very, just having a high bar for um, who personally wanted on the team. So that was, that was well, I'll give Ling, Ling this one. I think her perspective might be very interesting. <laughs> um, um, so, so yeah we met in the mba program you know how Sauter divides the the program into different periods um so we were in the same cohort basically in the first period and um i don't even remember i think Fatur reminded me that um, i think in one of the organizational behavior class there was this in-class activity and we were assigned to the same group Mm-hmm. Um, I think that was like the first two weeks where like everyone all looks the same to me. Like I was really, I don't remember people's name, um, but Fatur came up to me and he was really polite. He was like, oh, I don't, I don't remember your name. Can you please tell me again your name? I didn't know who he was, but I was just being very sarcastic. And I'm like, how dare you? How can you not know my name? So that was like kind of the star of the friendship. Um, and then since then, I was very candid every time we talk. Um, he asked me to try the product. As I said before, I was super skeptical because um, when he told me, like, it wasn't even the elevator pitch that he gave. It was just like, oh, we do it through life actor simulation for a difficult conversation. Like, it, it was all HR buzzwords and that I don't relate to. 
but it's only after I tried the product and I started to understand. Oh, he was underselling the product. There is so much more that people should know about it,、um, and that got me really interested. So we started the conversation,、um, and he was very nice to to offer the the co-founder position. And yes, and we took it from there. That's so funny. How I feel like that's always a great story of how you just kind of meet people, and then the first week of the MBA is always funny. That's one of my. Better friend, my best friend from the MBA program. We met on the first day, funny enough, I'm like, "Oh, he has a nice suit. It's not like it was like I think white or gray." I'm like, "Oh, that's cool. It's not just a black suit." I'm gonna go talk to him, and I think I was wearing a green jacket, and he was like, "Oh, this guy's wearing a different color suit." I'm gonna go talk to him because he's different. I had a nice,、uh, like a laptop bag, and then like three months later, we're like, "Hey, like, what, like, why did you end up like sitting beside me?" And we both had the same answer. We both thought we looked unique and cool. He had a nice watch, I had a nice bag, and then we're like, "Oh, we're the same person." We like bamboozle ourselves. <laughs> like we're next. This is gonna be a cool person. And yeah, we were the same and still great friends to that day. So the meeting story is always super interesting. So you're in the NBA now. You know you have the idea and you're trying to kind of define it and really start grow it. When you're speaking with prospective clients or kind of getting the business out there, like what are A lot of the sticking points. Is it the fact that you know maybe similar to like that a lot of people don't believe that actors can help, or is it the fact that maybe organizations think they don't need help that they're already great managers? Like, kind of what are what are the some of the common like stopping points or like mis mis misinterpretations or things that people aren't aware of when they're trying to especially get new customers? <laughs> Um, we've been doing a lot of business development in the past three weeks, and it was not easy. It was frustrating almost.、Um, like it's funny how you asked.、Um, I feel like there are so many things that's stopping them from going forward, like moving to the next step.、Um, I think like the first, the very common, super common one is the skepticism towards simulation.、Um, like、uh, unless you have tried it. Like I think for salespeople、um, who went through the training with role play or simulation, then you have a, already have a、mm-hmm. much Better understanding than the average、um, crowd.、Um, I think a lot of people they just don't understand how it's going to work, or they don't know what to expect,、um, and it's really hard to like relate acting back to training. They they don't seem equal, like equivalent to a lot of people or even the HRs.、Um, so I think that's one big gap that we need to. Do a lot of work on to educate people or just to show them. I think maybe that's the easier way.、Um, and then the other thing is. Recognizing that there's a gap in communication,、mm-hmm. in how they communicate to people and how people perceive their、mm-hmm. feedback,、um, it's hard to let、um, leaders admit that they are not the best in providing feedback or giving or leading conversations.、Um, so that's always challenging as well. I. I think what you said there, the last part, is always something I learned, especially within my industry, working within mental health and working with businesses, is that a lot of times leaders they're successful because they did it their way and they got to where they are. And and a lot of times trying to tell them like, hey, there might be places to improve, can almost hurt their own egos. I think when they're like, well, no, no, like I became the youngest VP at this company, I'm right. This is the way of doing it. But I think that's a challenge. I think with everyone, like being humble is very important. But I also think with the rise, I'm assuming also of like working from home in a lot of these situations, more people are. I think also like the the term everyone loves to throw around, like the Great Resignation, is that now employees、mm. are also not putting up with as much. Maybe because switching costs are lower. If you're working from home, you can easily apply and work from another job without having to change your life around. But I think right now a lot of organizations are realizing, oh, what we took for granted, maybe not having the greatest.、Uh, People and culture aspects are not having the greatest managers are now really coming under light. You no, know, coming under light. I think so. The, having a product, the product like this, I think, is more important now than ever. As there is harder time retaining talent, as employees are speaking up, and I think just because now there's options. No longer now you're if you live almost any city, I can apply to almost any job in Canada now, and as long as they like me, I don't have to move. Which I think is also adding a lot of pressure、um, to that. So it's really unique. Timing now, I think, with having a product like this to really have those conversations and putting a lot more light onto the ability that I think that classic saying like people don't leave jobs, they leave managers.、And、I think now it's more important than ever to ensure that the managers are having great communication.、Um, and I think one thing that's kind of interesting with your product is that there's humans on the other side. Like a lot of times, I think when people think of business,、um, and 
it's always been there, like AI. It all has to be fa- artificial efficiency, but humans are great at the end of the day because humans are humans and there's like a lot of intricacies. How did that, how do you pitch it to the actors? Like where you, where do you go to them and you're like, Hey, we're starting a business where you're going to do live simulation or for the actors you speak to, is it more common? Are they more aware of this industry? Like, Oh yeah, you know, I do this all the time. Like, how did you pitch it to them? Do you have a few of them or is it just really a few people you work with when working with other organizations? Unmute yourself. Sorry. My apologies. <laughs> um, so hiring actors is, is we don't try to go for external organizations. Um, that's because if you go for a unionized organization, the, the, the price tag gets pretty steep pretty fast. Mm-hmm. Um, so sourcing your own talent is, is quite challenging in itself. Um, I, I, I think it's safe to say that I got lucky the first time. I, I just reached out to a bunch of actors on LinkedIn um, and I asked them if they were looking for a job opportunity. Um, I pitched them the idea. Um, they weren't necessarily sure about how they were going to do it. So what I, do, I did for the interview phase is that I came up with a random scenario. Um, I pitched the exact idea. Uh, but I also had them like do the actual thing, like, hey, you don't have to come up with something crazy. Just do some improv and see whether this is something that you can resonate with. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have mostly le- they know everybody in the industry knows somebody who does like a healthcare live actor simulation. Mm-hmm. So you can sort of make that connection. Like we're just doing healthcare live actor simulations, mm-hmm. but for uh, managers and offices, right? So and workplaces. So it was that that it's kind of an easier connection mm-hmm. um, than the other side, which oh. is the um, actual people you've got to sell to. That one's, the, the actors aren't the hard part. Um, though sourcing good actors is not easy. Mm-hmm. And how do you find like a good versus a bad actor? Like, how, cause it's, I think that's a very interesting question is that you're obviously hiring or finding people that have a skill set you may not have. How do you find the good between the bad? Is it just like typical interview styles or have you learned throughout these, you know, past months, like a way of targeting who's, may be better for this position than others for the for the targeting part i, I again i got lucky with my mm-hmm. first actor and they've been the one who referred me to all yeah. the other actors um and so the quality pool has been con- not consistent i'd say because we've rejected several mm-hmm. actors um, when you put them through the interview and the actual scenario and if you don't give them too much structure you don't give them all the scripts um, it's an, it becomes an improv skill and not every actor is great as an improv. Mm-hmm. So if you are really great at improv, um, you will do well in the scenario. You won't look like you are, um, you're struggling as much. So my first actor that I ever hired, she was so good at improv that I was like, we, we, it was a very believable performance. And if it's not believable, you almost go like, okay, this person may be not it, but typically we give them two chances. So we give them, we do the first round of um the role play and then we do a second round um if they don't do so the just because we want to get the jitters out some people are nervous um so improv is the skill um that you are that is that you are optimizing for so and if you can find that skill you're 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 pretty good i think that's so interesting i think for a lot of people who don't know acting that like improv is a separate skill set than acting i think it's like anything else i always compare it to like when when I have friends, you know, in the tech sector, someone's like, oh, I'm a programmer. And they're like, oh, you can do like front end, back end, like uh, server structures. Like you can do everything. They're like, no, no, no. I am just a like front end developer. I'm just an Android developer. They're like, oh, can you program my iPhone? They're like, no, that is a separate skill set. And I think with acting, that's the same thing where like in any arts or any in- industry, it's like finding out that there, hey, there's like different genres of acting. There's different skill sets I think is important. It's kind of cool that, I think like anything else, networking is a key to this. And like you said, mm-hmm. starting off with one good individual kind of connecting with others is always the best way of going and also the best way of finding great talent and kind of getting that. And looking back almost on my life, funny enough, I think improv is one of those skill sets I always downplayed where I'm like, ah, you know, I don't know if I want to do improv. I don't want to get on stage. But everyone I've talked to, or not, okay, I'm being a little facetious now, but a lot of people I've spoken to are highly successful. A lot of times they attribute it back to like, oh, I took acting classes, Toastmasters. I went to like an improv class weekly and that gave me the ability to publicly speak. Or I did stand-up comedy. Stand-up comedy also seems to be another skill where it's live interaction and really trying to go with the flow. So it's kind of interesting how 
my life always ends up going back to like do improv people like learn how to communicate with people is such an important skill so it sounds like you know you're starting to form the business you're starting to grow it out at what point i guess this might be early on did you start realizing like hey you know what this could be a real business here we nearly set the foundation was it when you were in the program did you already realize like this is something real or was there a point where you started realizing like this might not be a side hustle or a hobby project this could really be a business with employees that can really grow was that found early on in your head or was this a little bit more throughout the process when things started clicking i think first of all we've we found similar businesses mm -hmm. um in other countries um that were relatively successful mm -hmm. but didn't scale um Interesting. and so the challenge was almost like so we know this this okay so we we're doing our comparative analysis mm -hmm. like i think we knew that it works mm -hmm. in per se like i think the question becomes is are the founders the right people to make it work mm -hmm. um and you've always got to look at yourself not in the egotistical way but like mm -hmm. from like an outside perspective like am i the right person to run this business um i think that was a more important question than um then, then the fact that as I knew this was business was going to succeed. Is this, mm -hmm. is, is this whether we, as in Lingana, are we the right people um, to run this business, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think because of our lived experiences, we are. I, I think that's kind of what the important part is. Uh, the other important part is, could you get, I think my goal at the end of the year, mm -hmm. um, and, and then once after Ling joined, so there was a, okay, can we get at least, two paying customers. So the first one we got in um, in January, and there was a bit of a, uh, the COVID part, and there's a bit of a lull period. Um, and so I'm just like, okay, so if we can get a couple more customers, um, this might be a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and luckily, well, I don't know if it was luck or skill, or whatever it was, um, we did end up getting uh, a couple more customers. And so paying us a, good price because at the first with the first time we made a sale it was more of a like a we were very we, yeah. we said okay like here's 50 70 percent off right and so it wasn't uh it's was barely break it probably didn't even break even now that i think about it um and so like can we can we now grow scalably and can we like get customers paying a proper price for this and so that's yeah. kind of where it began so so that that needed more stuff need to be added in the product. So all that, um, and and what we really knew was when we got feedback from our first customer, um, our second, sorry, our second customer. Our second customer was so happy with it. They were, everybody was giving us testimonial. I think we had an average, we had an average uh, NPS score of 9.6. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so like the average was like, everybody was between a nine or either a nine or a 10. Um, every learner that went through it, um this this the the ceo raved about us like he and and, and so and then the next one after that um uh, we had a 9.2 which was awesome um and then again the, the 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 customer raved about us again so that's that's kind of where we knew okay this is something that's actually helping people um and how do we continue to do that um and i think the question now now we've got to to answer is like can we make it scale Right. Yeah. Um, and how many customers can we get, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think that is a, I'm not, I wouldn't know if say it's a good problem to have, but at least I think it's a, in, from a lot of startups I spoke to, a good problem to have when you're like, hey, we're having success. How can we get more success? It's a lot better than no one likes this. How do we get people to like this? I think uh, the challenge you're facing is one that many businesses face, but also is, is one that at least means like, hey, how can we get we have some success here. How do we expand? And I do think that even in my experiences working on a lot more, like I'm not double side. Like I've worked in a lot of double side marketplaces or things that use humans a lot or like networks. Um, we had the same thing or ideas where it's like, Hey, how can we scale this? Oh, you need more people. And then you always find a way you don't stop. If there's a red light, you keep going until the red light and then you figure out a solution uh, and then keep going. So I think that's a unique situation where you've had paying customers, you had feedback, which I think is great because I always found once a customer pays, they have no reason to be nice to you. 
If they do not like it, they will tell you. And I've worked for many startups where you love your product. It's like your baby. You're like, this is great. And then you go talk to someone. They're like, this is horrible. And you're like, no, I worked all my, all these hours on this. It's perfect. So I think, like you said, having that feedback and scores early on is so important to developing a product. Not only you like, but you can get other individuals or other organizations paying. So did, I guess this jumping back a bit, but this is always an interesting question is, you know, that, you know, that business has been running a bit. Is there anything within the entrepreneurship world that you find easier than you thought it would be? And is there a few things that are a lot harder than you thought you would be before this all started? Um, easier. <laughs> I think that's going to I like that question because everyone, it's always what's harder, but what was easier? And that's always an interesting uh, answer you always hear. I think um, my original expectation or anticipation is that there will be a lot of disagreement between the co-founders because um, I think it's basically a brainstorm session every day um, and like despite how similar or how hardworking we both are there's always different perspective um, so I, I think that was my anticipation um, and um, so I think after starting uh, working on this venture full-time it is better than what I thought there are still challenges so there are still like convincing that we need to do but it's not as dramatic as the ones that i have observed from other channels um the the difficult part i think uh we touch on so many of those already in this conversation um i think just the uh, mindset switch um like switching from full-time corporate employee to a full-time MBA student, and then now to a full-time entrepreneur. Um, and that all happened within the past 12 months, basically. Um, so personally, I think that was a lot to process. Um, like coming from a middle manager where I had a lot of resource in my hands, um, like for marketing, for sales, for product development, to going back to school and being um, a receiver in a class. Mm -hmm. I'm just taking in a lot of new info and now I am in charge and I am making decisions for venture, which can basically decide the future of the venture, whether it survives in a month or die in a month. Um, I'm also a parent. So like with multiple roles, mm -hmm. um, it does become quite stressful sometimes. Mm -hmm. And Fatur can definitely speak to that because he sees me every day and see, he sees the, the stress level going up and down. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. That's for my end. That's a that's a really great one. Um, yeah, this. I think yeah, it's similar to what Ling said. Though I I I did not think that I I I just so I've I've done done the solar founder life mm -hmm. for a while. Like like not not no very little part of me was like, um, the the communication was going to be so that that part I didn't have, uh, but. The other part was, I think, the hardest part, or the, or the 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 part that's easier now, that wasn't easier in the beginning. I guess that's what's it, is that you get used to the up and the down, and so you almost expect it. Like you, in the beginning, I was like very stressed out because of mm -hmm. like, okay, one, like one hour you're up, the other hour you're down, one hour you're up, you're this is like that, mm -hmm. that variation like really stresses you out. Mm -hmm. Um, and I now after running this for about a year and a half up though half of that was in while I was in the MBA. Um, so not doing it full time. It was, it's, I've gotten used to the variation. Yeah. Um, and, and it's just kind of gotten easier over time. Um, and so you're just, oh, it's, it's what it is. It's the life I chose. Um, and so you're okay with, so you're okay with the, with the, with the pitfalls though, when they do come. Um, What's hard? What's harder is sort of the the strategic aspect. Is is really like if something is not working. Like, at what point do you decide to make either a major pivot, mm -hmm. or because right now we have we're having those discussions right now. Like, well, how can we? What are we going to do to make ourselves scale quickly? Mm -hmm. How are we going to make ourselves sticky? Right. Mm -hmm. Um. 
and it's it's actually like the those those strategy questions like you can sometimes be paralyzed by the analysis um and if you are too paralyzed by the analysis then it's almost it's it's you will never know because mm -hmm. we all like to mbas like to think we're yeah. very very smart right um and we're like oh we're the creme de la creme or like the have you ever seen like it's if you if you don't test the market like it's it's yeah. it's it's kind of a watch right so yeah. um no matter how smart you think you are, there's always a facet that you're missing um so not getting caught up in that analysis paralysis is hard because like execution and like somebody telling you your baby is ugly is always harder yeah. um yeah so it's it's uh it's it, that's the that's a tough part yeah mm -hmm. and sales sales is not easy i'm not i'm an engineer i'm an introvert yeah um it's the b2b especially is not yeah. simple it's quite a lot of um human human dynamics if you would yeah. put it that way like it's a lot of yeah mm -hmm. that's why i actually went back to the mba so i could pivot out of sales a little bit and get to more of a strategy role because yeah sales speaking of the ups and downs like an entrepreneur i feel like sales is the same thing where it's like yeah you're on i used to do 200 calls a day and you're just like well just a lot of rejection but you have to go with the smile on your face and i think it's the same thing where it's like just a lot of negativity and a lot of unpredictability so that's super interesting and i think also what you said with the analysis paralysis i always find it interesting speaking to mbas about that because that, that is a challenging thing where you're like okay i'm very educated i'm making good decisions but how do I make a decision where there is no right answer and no one can tell you if you're right or wrong. I think that's always hard where when I worked in larger corporate organizations, like I would have an opinion, I'd submit my proposal or submit, you know, my documents. And then my boss or the VP would say, yay or nay. Like I would have someone else almost fact check or, or I could try to show off to where when it came to bringing startups, I'm like, I think this works. And they're like, okay, go ahead and try it. And you're like, okay, do uh, maybe uh, and you start freaking out i think because like you you said is that like whatever decision you make it happens like it's going forward you're really controlling the outcome and i think that is a that's good to hear that you know like those highs and lows you always learn you know today you know it maybe matters five minutes now but in five hours or five years no one's going to care about it and i think it's getting used to realizing that the goods are never going to stay that good but the bad's never going to stay that bad so you just kind of have to ride it out and hopefully overall it's a positive net positive i always I think I read that. I don't know if this is from UBC, but I always read that it's like, funny enough, talk a lot about babies and businesses. It always seems like there was always good parallels. Um, is that like people always say like being a parent's very hard. And in the moment, everyone's like, so stressful. It's, I'm miserable right now. But over like a year, everyone's like, I love it. It was like happiness. Like overall, they're happy. I think it was startups. Like in the moment you talk to an entrepreneur and they're like, this is miserable. I hate this. But then if you want, in five years, they're like, Greatest time of my life. It was because you just remember the good times. You always forget about the bad times. And I feel like that's a similar thing with having a family and having a business is looking back. You always you just fought, you always like, oh, the good times were good. But the bad times, you're like, ah, they were never that bad. But super interesting story. And obviously, like super quick success you've had with actually getting paying customers so early on in the journey. Um, what does the next like few months, few years look like? And how if people are interested, can they get in touch and get involved? Yeah, if you um, if you want to get in touch with us, we just uh, reach out to me or Ling. It's either father at alleviatelabs.ca, um, and I can put that in the chat, or Ling at alleviatelabs.ca. Uh, what was your original question? That that part I uh, didn't. Uh, what, and uh, yeah, and like, what kind of what does the future look for you for you guys? Like, what does the next? I mean, five years is always hard to say, but I guess next few months, next year, possibly look like. I think it's uh, right now we're hiring a sales intern, which is super exciting. Um, or uh, we that hopefully turning that salesperson into a full uh, or at least a part time sales role. Mm -hmm. uh, I think our KPI right now is just um, can we get from these three four customers that we have now, and can we we get mm -hmm. six more? Can we get to that ten a customer uh, milestone, uh, and then get feedback from that, and also rolling out our technology. Um, and and making sure that um, it's received well as well. So those are the few things that we've got going for us right now. But the main KPI, um, fortunately or unfortunately, is sales. I, know, I always like to say, like, money, 
cynical as it sounds, this sounds a little bit MBA-ish. Like money always solves all problems. Like when there's money <laughs> in the door, other things can can worry about. Um, I always, I always thought that was so cynical to working in startups, and especially when there's no revenue, you're like, everything can go good, but if we can't sell anything, that's the big issue right now. So I think uh, sales is always an important KPI, but also I think your product very unique, but also like you said, both have impacted your lives. And I really do see a need for it in the market, especially as uh, managers are a little bit more under scrutiny now being able to communicate effectively with employees due to the great resignation.